yeah, that you are, you are great. You're, there's no one um, who is like you, who is greater than you, um, who offers a love to us, um, yeah, like anyone else does. And so, um, yeah, God, I thank you uh, that, yeah, you are great beyond measure, beautiful beyond um, description, Father, and um, that we see that at the cross as you gave your son that, um, yeah, you should love people who uh, who fail, uh, who mess up, who make mistakes. Um, yeah, God, uh, you still uh, fully know us, um, even still, and um, even though you're perfect and holy God, um, you fully love us. And so, um, God, I thank you that um, you're faithful and you're good even through, uh, yeah, through every season of life. Um, yeah, and so, God, I pray, uh, just as we enter this time of hearing from your word, Father, that you would um, speak uh, mightily, mightily and powerfully through uh, Josiah, and that you would give us hearts and ears that are ready to receive your word. Uh, Holy Spirit, would you uh, move and speak um, and act and work in this place. Um, help us to be attentive and awake um, so that we can, uh, yeah, so we can hear what you have for us. Um, yeah, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Um, yeah. Hey, good morning, guys. Before we get into our message, a couple things I want to ask for us to do. Um, one is as we are in retreat, you know, we go home at night and we get to sleep in our own beds, which is great, especially for middle school boys, because at the retreat center, that place is wicked hot. It's like sleeping in an oven. But here, uh, we also get to go home to like our computers or our TVs. And, and one thing I wanna ask for us to do, I should have asked last night, but for us tonight, and even going to Sunday morning, can we just, even like if, as best as we can, refrain from like being really deep into our, our shows or our Valorant, like you're gonna drop anyway. <laughs> so there's, there's no point in playing, but just so that we can have like our hearts undistracted by God. And, and um, that's just a couple of days, and then, and, then one, and then we can go back to our team. But that's so that we can hear from God only in this time. That's just a request that we can have. We can get better sleep, so that sleep is a way of, of worshiping God, too. Another thing I just want to ask for us to do right now, before we get started. Um, we prayed for Matthias last night, and I think what we want to do is let's pray for him every session um, until he's, he's back with us safely. Um, and so... As you guys have heard some details, Matthias is a senior of ours, rising freshman. He had his uh, an acute pneumothorax on Sunday night. Um, uh, his lung collapsed, so just some breathing issues. And it, it can be a little, really scary, um, and, but he was taken to the hospital, um, to the ER. He had some emergency procedures done. Um, and I think yesterday I, I was kind of in this, unfortunately, um, complacent place where I thought he would be okay. And it's like, okay, he's moved on from, from like a danger zone, but um, there were some complications yesterday too. Um, and so can we just pray for like a minute or two for our brother? As one part of our body suffers, so should we in a way that we can suffer with him, um, to love him and to, to be with him. So can we just in spirit, just for 30 seconds to a minute, let's just pray for him, his body, his mind. Last night, Daniel Chang talked about fears I'm sure that he has fears, and his parents do too, for Nathaniel, for the rest of us too. But for 30 seconds, let's just pray for Matthias that God would bring healing, that he would guide the doctors, the nurses, and the staff. Let's pray for him, and then I'll open us up in prayer. Jesus, you are the, the greatest physician of all because you fully know what's going on in our bodies, in our minds, and our souls. And you're able to tend to those. God, we pray for our brother Matthias, um, who's in this scary place right now. We pray for comfort and for peace that passes all understanding. It says in your word in Isaiah 26, 3-4, that you will bring 
perfect peace to those whose hearts trust in you, because you, O oh Lord, our Lord, are the rock eternal. So will you be that rock eternal for Matthias, for his parents, for Nathaniel, and for us today too? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as, as we go into today, today's title is called God Knows Our Tears. Um, and it's, it's looking into God knowing our pain and our struggles. So I don't know about you, but do you ever get this sinking feeling where your heart drops into your gut when something goes really bad? So for me, nothing else in this world can elicit that when I, uh, unless I come to my parking spot and my car is gone. That means it got towed, okay? And that's probably the worst things you will have as an adult. It's just like, oh my gosh, when life is going bad or good, car problems are always there. Maybe for you, it's when you tell a really funny story and no one laughs, right? So you want to show off, but no one wants to join that. Maybe it's when you catch your friends on Snapchat or Instagram and they're hanging out without you, even though you could ask them to hang out. Maybe it's when you put in the hard, hard work to copy and paste from a Wikipedia page and you get caught by your principal, right? What's the worst pain that you felt in your life? I actually asked some of our students, so I asked a lot of you guys, what's the worst pain you felt? Whether it's physical or beyond physical. So I just wanna share some of the answers. One student said, getting three or four shots at one time at the doctor's office, getting stitches on my head with no anesthesia, that hurts, period cramps, I don't know what that's like, getting COVID, so one student, Another person said, when I was five and I got my hair dyed, the lady did it wrong and I got chemical burns on my head. Wow, at five years old. Also, who dyes their hair at five years old? <laughs> um, another one said, when I was dancing and got kicked in the face and my braces cheese grated my gums. That's bad. Hajun said, when, you, when I, Josiah, don't have a girlfriend. But Hajun, you guys are my girlfriend, so it's okay. Socially, <laughs> that's a collective drug. Um, <clears throat> another student said, whenever I have no friends when I move to someplace new. Someone else said, when I have no community or there's no one around me to trust. When I see my family or friends go through a hard time. Breaking up with someone that I really cared for. My best friend replacing me twice. And losing a friend of mine to suicide feeling hopeless and lonely as if God was not there. The greatest pain I felt is my own thoughts that are self-destructive, full of anger and bitterness. My greatest pain was my, my sibling ran away from home, being hurt by someone that I should be getting comfort and support from, like a parent. Another student said, the emotional damage and hurt I've had from my parents. Another student said, a few months ago when I felt really hopeless and had no other options, feeling so alone and that there was nothing I could do for how I was. And this is us. These are the stories that are really just the tip of the iceberg of our youth ministry. We're not unfamiliar with pain. We know what it's like to go through really hard things, and especially sometimes in our, our context, maybe our Asian American context, to go through pain alone because we're told that our pain can be a burden to other people or that our pain doesn't bring honor to ourselves or to our family. And so we're asked to carry our pain alone. Can I submit something to you guys? I, I think that we can go through a lot of physical pain. You can, you can get chemical burns on your scalp for, for hair dye. It'll, it'll hurt, but years later, it will, it will fade. I think one of the greatest pains that we will go through in life is the pain that of feeling utterly abandoned and neglected. And at the core of that is to feel unloved and unwanted. And for so many of us, that can really be the source of our tears. And God's word for us this morning is that God sees those tears and he knows the pain and he wants to do something about it. So I want to invite you into a story of someone in the Bible, someone who is very beautiful and so worth loving when other people didn't think so. Someone who stings her whole life 
of being unloved and unwanted. And her name is Leah. You might have heard of her name. If you haven't, it's okay. We'll get into it. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the very first book in the Bible. It's called Genesis. And it's Genesis chapter 29. We're going to read from verses 15 to 35. Genesis 29, 15 to 35. So as you're turning there, if you don't know the story of Leah, let me just catch you up to speed a little bit. And it's a good reminder. I want you to understand that there is, bring your back, yourself back into a place that's not like here. It's old, there's farming, there's a way, there's a culture that's very, very different than ours. It's thousands of years ago. There's a guy named Jacob, okay? And Jacob's not the nicest guy because he comes from a not great family. You see, in his family, his dad favored his eldest son. His name is his older brother was, was Esau. And Jacob, however, was favored by his mom. So you can imagine that in that household, like it's having like one parent went to UF and I went to FSU and just rivalry all the time, right? But that's how it was in this family to a greater scale. Constant favoritism, constant showing of love and appreciation in an unfair way. And so Jacob, he gets his mom's help to deceive his dad, Isaac, who is blind at this point, to steal the blessing from his older brother, Esau. So the dad's like, Esau, I'm gonna bless you. I want you to have lots of children and have lots of animals, yada, yada, yada. And Jacob, because his dad's blind, he puts, he deceives him in, in a in very uh, cunning way. But because he steals the blessing, he goes on the run because his older brother is really, really mad. And he goes on the run and he comes across this beautiful shepherdess named Rachel. And Rachel is a girl that he really wants to marry. So he, but Mar Rachel also has an older sister named Leah. And they also have a dad named Laban who is very greedy, he's very selfish, and he's actually just as deceitful and cunning and evil. And, and like he schemes a lot, just like Jacob does. So it runs in the family. So let me read for us Genesis 29, verses 15 to 35. It says, then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what will your wages be? So Jacob is trying to work, to work and put in the, the effort to buy, in a way, Rachel from her father. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man, so stay with me. So Jacob, he served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, all right, give me your wife, my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and they made a big feast for the wedding. But in the evening, and we're gonna assume that there's a lot of drinking going on, so Jacob's not totally cognizant. Laban took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and he went in to her, which means he slept with her. <coughs> Excuse me, Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Oh, how the turntables. Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other one also in return for serving me another seven years. This is messed up on all levels. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Now Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called him Reuben, for she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction and suffering, for now my husband will love me. It's a really sad way to name a son. It speaks of a lot of sadness there. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me the son also. 
And she called his name Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. But she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. This is crazy. It's a crazy story. It's messed up. The Bible is full of a lot of crazy, messy situations, especially dysfunctional family situations. I mean, if you can imagine, if you have a sister, if you're a girl and you have a sister, getting married to the same guy with your sister, like that's, that's a whole other level of just weird and awkward. Or if you're a brother, the guy and your brother, you get married to the same girl. It's a can of worms. And this is what happens. But what I want us to focus on is a character who's often overlooked in the story, and that's Leah. And I want us to put ourselves as much as we can in Leah's shoes. It's difficult, but once we go into her story, we realize that it's not too different from ours in some ways. No, we're not in as much of a mess up situation to be used as a bride, but in some ways we have those same sentiments of feeling unloved and unwanted. So the, we have three thoughts. Um, the first thought is that um, pain that is not transformed is transmitted. Pain that's not transformed is transmitted. And this is kind of like the sowing the seeds before we go into Leah's story. But I want us to see if we can understand Leah better and the, the subsequent thoughts. I want us to first see the mess up life of Jacob because it's Jacob's mess up life and Laban's mess up life that really hurts Leah in the end, right? So we have to go back a little bit. Jacob's a guy who's really empty inside desperate for someone else's approval and longing. And for him, it was approval of his father, which he never received because his father always favored the older brother. And because of that, Jacob lived a life reinforced by his own mom that it's okay to deceive your dad in order to gain love and approval. And that's a pretty messed up ethic. As we go through Jacob's life, even though God starts to change him, Jacob still has a profound sense of inner emptiness where he wakes up and then when he sees Rachel for the first time, he's like, oh my gosh, maybe for the first time in my life, this woman, this prize can bring me happiness in this life. Jacob has two choices. It kind of brings that. There's Leah, who's the older one, and there's Rachel. So when it says in verse 17 that Leah was weak on the eyes, it doesn't mean that or had weak eyes, it doesn't mean that she had bad eyesight. It's a Hebrew metaphor for saying that it like hurt to look at her. It's pretty messed up, but that's Jacob's perspective of like, she was so unattractive to him that he didn't want to look at her. Contrast to that, Rachel was beautiful to him. And so he goes with what he likes to see, what his eyes behold. Jacob was so in love with her or so thirsty that he was willing to work seven years for her, for free. But in spite of all this, because he shows his favoritism to one girl over the other, because he has received that and been the recipient of that, because he's lied and deceived his whole life to his brother and to his parents, he's actually on the receiving end of deception for this time. Laban tricks him. He does this ruse when Jacob's drunk to switch the brides. And we see that because Jacob has not, has been hurt in his past of being the one who's less favored by his father, because he's been taught that lying is okay, and that's a way to receive and earn love, he doesn't transform that pain, but instead he transmits it to the next person. And that goes to Leah and to Rachel and to the people around him, and even to his own sons. So as we see later in Jacob's life, because he doesn't transform his pain, because God doesn't do the work within him, he transmits that pain to other people. And that's what we're gonna see in our lives too. If you have been the recipient of someone else's pain, I can guarantee you, they need to take responsibility and credit for that. At the same time, understand that hurt people hurt people. So people who are hurt will say hurtful things to other people. It speaks to something deep inside where 
there's an insecurity and a profound sense of emptiness where like, if I, can, if I can be better and superior than this person, then I will feel a little better. And we'll see that tonight when we go through the prodigal son with two older brothers. Laban, the father of Rachel and Leah, is not any better at all. He's a dad who wants to make a profit off of his daughter by making Jacob work for free for, for seven years. When they counted that up, that was like 40 shekels per year, um, which in that time is, you would make about 10 shekels. So he's, Jacob's working a lot for free. And the dad's profiting off that. He's killing two birds with one stone where he looks at his daughter Leah. He says, my daughter Leah is not very pretty. No man is gonna marry her. And so the only way that my daughter can get married is if I lie to someone else, deceive them and trick them into marrying my daughter. Can you imagine having a father like that? Who doesn't see the beauty and the worth and the value inside of you, but instead sees you as a commodity to get rid of or to make money off of. What a dysfunctional family. So we can imagine what Leah has felt. Leah in this story has passed, is receives pain because of two men who could not transform their pain from brokenness to receiving mercy from God. Instead, they use that as a power play to make others feel inferior and make them feel superior. You see, Jacob didn't look at Leah, who is now his wife, as someone to love, but someone who could bear him sons, someone who could bear him children. And Laban, in the same way, was like that. You and I, we both know Jacob's and Laban's. We know people in our lives who have not properly dealt with their issues, their pain, and their brokenness, and their hurt, and their sins, and thus, they have hurt you immensely and in unspeakable ways. So when people are nasty to us, when they use us for their pleasure or for their profit, when people don't value us for who we are, but based on what we can do, it comes from a place from them where they have not allowed God to work through their sin, through their brokenness, through their pain, to transform it, but instead they pass it on. And unfortunately, we become the recipients of that. And if we don't transform that pain, we also might end up like Jacob and Laban. Because pain that sits inside our, our hearts, it doesn't just stay in a box, but it starts to fester. And pain that isn't brought to God in prayer leads to bitterness and anger. And so what we see in our lives is that anger is always like a secondary emotion. When people get mad, it's, it's because they're hurt. It's because there's something deeper inside of them that says you're not loved, you're not worthy, you're not worth being with. This morning we read through a devotional about Peter and facing our failures. And I wanna to talk to us like, when I was asking our students, where do you feel the effects of failure the strongest? And it's something that I've, I kind of sense, and our teacher sends, whenever we ask you guys prayer requests in Sunday school class, the go-to answer is like, ah, oh, I have a test this week. I'm like, okay, we'll pray for your test. We'll pray for your SATs or your college apps. But those prayer requests speak to something that's deeper. And when we ask the middle school boys, like, what is, why do you fear failing in school? Let's say you get all Fs. What does that failure speak to? And speaks to parents who will be disappointed in you, teachers who will be disappointed in your work, and yourself, disappointed by your own your failure to produce what you think you are capable of. And so we're always afraid of failing in this way. When we're afraid of failing, that leads us to a place where we think our value and our worth is based on what we can produce. If I'm a good student, do my parents love me? If I'm not getting the grades, or if I'm not successful in music, or in band, or in art, or in sports, do my parents view me as a waste of money, or as a waste of time and energy? They may not say it sometimes, but sometimes that's how we can feel. And our feelings are legitimate. 
In every sphere of life, so I'll tell you this universal truth, in every sphere of life that you're in, in school, in your friend groups, in the family with your siblings, at church even, in work especially when you get older and you start working, everything you do is built on a tightrope. You are asked to walk this tightrope, this, this very thin line, and on either side is a chasm that goes way deep. And you're asked to perform, and everyone judges you or they value you based on how you perform or, or treat or, or produce work, good works. But the very one place in this world that doesn't ask you to walk that tightrope is the gospel. That's the one place where Jesus says, I will walk that tightrope for you so that you don't have to walk on it. I don't judge you based on how well you walk that line because no one can walk it well. You're gonna fail in school. You're gonna fail your assignment sometimes. You're gonna fail your friends. You're gonna disappoint your parents. You're gonna disappoint your friends. You're gonna disappoint me. You're gonna disappoint people in the church. Everyone, we judge each other based on how well people walk their tight ropes towards us. But Jesus is the only one who can unconditionally love us in a way where he doesn't ask us to walk that tight rope because he's walked it for us. And he asks us to simply be so that he can love us. Um, Daniel Chang shared a, a similar story about cheating in school. And I've had that same experience. I didn't copy from a Wikipedia page, but I cheated in college on my exams. And when I've brought that to my parents, as it's a longer story, but I wanna focus in on bringing that to my parents as, and it had a similar effect as Daniel Chang did. But school has always been a part of my life where I felt like my worth and value came from doing well. And part of the reason why I wanted to go into pre-med at UVA was because I wanted to prove to my parents that I could, I was smart enough that their work in homeschooling me all those years in the mission field paid off. And so as I worked, I realized that I wasn't capable of getting the grades I want to, and so I took the shortcut route. I did what Jacob and Laban did. I lied and I cheated on my exams to earn something that I didn't deserve. Because for me, the ends justify the means. And the same can be for us if the I, if the pressure of identity is placed on what we produce, then we'll go through whatever it takes to get that result so that we can earn more love from our parents or from people who are judging us, our friends, our family, our school teachers. But the gospel shows us that we're not asked to walk this rope alone, but Jesus has walked it for us. Our second point, our thought, is that we all come into this world looking for someone who is looking for us. And this is from Adam Young, he's one of my favorite counselors, but he says, we all come into this world looking for someone who's looking for us. And that's the case for Leah. We see that even though Jacob and Laban had it wrong, because of Leah's pain, she felt the same value system that Jacob and Laban had. You see, Jacob had this idea that he, so, he felt the profound sense of emptiness in his heart. And he thought to himself, if I just have Rachel, my life will be happy. And you see it because he's willing to work more than he should, seven years for a woman in exchange for her as for a hand in marriage. And if we, a lot of us, we have something on our, on, our, on our sights. It might be that college we want to get into. It's a career. It's for that guy to notice us or that girl to say yes when we ask her if she wants to go on a date or talk to us. But there's always something that we're like, if I could just have this, then my life will be happy. Then I will be a little bit happier and I'll feel more loved. And Leah, unfortunately, buys into it a little bit too. And we see it through the ways that she has her children. So if we're looking back into verse 31, the story shifts. We look into Leah's life. Leah has three sons at first. And she names them. And remember in the Bible, we talked about this at SNF, but names in the Bible have a profound sense and meaning to them that plays into the story. And so when she names her first son Reuben, she says, it's because the Lord has looked upon my suffering, for now my husband will love me. And she gets the first part right. Like we had, she had it in the first half. Like she, she sees that God 
does look upon her suffering, but she hopes that having a son will gain her husband's love for her. And it continues, when she has her second son, she says, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. She called him Simeon. And then she says, when she has Levi, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. She's competing against her younger sister. Like, what a horrible way to live that way. In the same way that Jacob's family preferred one child over the other, Jacob continues that by preferring one wife over the other. It's a horrible place to be in. God doesn't condone, he's not tolerant of this polygamous relationship or this marriage. And we see the effects of the consequences of when we allow this sinful way of marriage to happen. That God's called from the very beginning in Genesis chapter three, and two and three, that we're called to one husband and one wife. But Jacob and Laban distort what God has called us to do. And because of that, we see so many other things happen as a fallout, people get hurt. But Leah rep represents something. That every time we're in pursuit of things, we think that something good can make things in our life right. That it will always be there. In Leah's heart, it's, it's her husband's love and affection. And it's a good thing. It's like, I want someone to finally love me, to want me. My whole life, my dad has not wanted me. I've been cast aside to the side. My voice is not heard in the family. Now I have this situation where I can, I can have a new start. It's a good desire to have. But unfortunately, the love that she's looking for is in the wrong way. She's hoping that what she can like, really produce will gain the affection of her husband. Good things like family or marriage in place of God, in the end, if we use that to our means, we end up with nothing. And so I want us to paint ourselves in Leah's shoes, but to step into her story. If your whole life you've been compared to another sibling, your father compares you, he constantly tells you you're not as pretty or good looking, you're not as beautiful because he sees your outside rather than what's inside of you. If you yourself have that same pain and affliction that you carry upon yourself and you condemn yourself, that speaks so much worse sometimes than what our parents, what Laban would say to Leah. And then your own husband, who has been betrothed to you by deception, doesn't love you even when you give him what he wants, which is in the case of sons. How would you feel other than unwanted or unloved? There's a story called the Velveteen Rabbit. It's a children's story, but it's a story where there's this stuffed animal rabbit, and he wants to be loved, so he has a consciousness, he's kind of alive. And what he's, he's hoping he hears is that when a child loves you, then you become, this magical thing happens. And so the, the rabbit's on this kind of quest to understand what, what this magic is. And he comes to this orphanage where this group of boys who are slick and they're, they're slowly dying, they come to love the Velveteen Rabbit. And as they love him, he starts to gain sensation in his limbs and he's able to move around. And it comes to a point where this young one boy becomes so attached to him that he carries him wherever he goes. He sleeps with him, he takes him on walks outside, he takes him into the bath. And as he starts loving him more and more, the, the young Velveteen Rabbit starts to kind of fall apart. The buttons fall off, the hair gets frizzled. And at one point, because of a smallpox outbreak, the Velveteen Rabbit is left alone, forgotten in the box. And as he's in storage, he finds this horse. And so in, this, in the story, <clears throat> the Velveteen Rabbit and the horse are talking. And the Velveteen Rabbit asks the horse, what does it mean for this magic? What does it mean to be real? And the skin horse says, real isn't how you are made. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Well, does it hurt? Asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the horse, for he was always truthful. When you, are, when you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Well, does it happen all at once, like, like being wound up, the rabbit asked, or bit by bit? 
It doesn't happen all at once in the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. And that's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or to those who have been carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. Leah was in this way, ugly to Jacob, and it was hopelessly ugly to her father Laban, who treated her that way, treated her as an object of beauty or as an object to be sold off. These are the people who could not understand, as a skin horse said, what it means to love someone in a way that they are real. And when you aren't loved, the skin horse says, you aren't real. So can I ask us to do something really, really difficult right now? I want us to do, like as we go into this retreat, it's gonna bring up hard memories because Jesus wants to bring healing to our lives and he's the best at it. But bringing healing requires taking us to a place where the wounds are the deepest. And we have to dig into the wound, that's where we start. But Jesus is really, really good at bringing healing to those places. Resurrection doesn't come without death first. So I want us to, I want to ask a question. I want us to sit in silence for a little bit, but just to think about and to call upon a memory. And the question is this, when have you felt most unloved or unwanted? Who in your life makes you feel unloved the most. There may be a specific memory that comes to mind. When you hear the word unloved or unwanted, you might think of someone. And as the thought says, we all come into this world looking for someone who's looking for us. That's Leah's cry. And that's our cry too. But Jesus is one who came looking for us. He's one who left his throne in heaven to come look for us because he values us and he sees us not of what we can produce or what beauty we can offer to this world, but simply because of who we are, precious and worthy in his sight. And it says in Zephaniah 3.17 that the Lord our God is in our midst, the mighty one who will save. He rejoices over you with gladness, he quiets you by his love, and he exalts over you with loud singing. That speaks to a delight that God has. It doesn't say that he exalts and rejoices over you when you do good or when you go to all the SFs or all the Sunday school classes on time and do all the readings. It's not when you've gone straight A's in your semester. There's no prerequisite that God has to sing and to exalt and to rejoice over you. There's a worthiness that he sees inside of you because we have dignity as people, as his creation. And that leads us to our last point, our last thought, that God became unwanted for us so that we can be wanted by him. God became unwanted for us so that we would be wanted by him. When Leah has this fourth child, she goes through three sons, and she's hoping every time that as I have this son, maybe my husband will love me a little more. Maybe when I get a, this good grade, or maybe when I get into that school, maybe when I have this accomplishment or this award sitting on my desk, that my parents will love me a little bit more. Maybe when I give in or give to my friend who asks so much from me every time, maybe they'll love me a little bit more. But Leah finally comes to this place where she realizes that the deepest passions that she has in her heart is not 
giving, providing any fulfillment. She knows the Lord, so she calls upon him, and she gives everything to her to God. In the symbolic way, she says, no longer am I going to pursue the empty affections of my messed up husband. This guy that I've been used to, to marry, Jacob, he's not going to provide fulfillment. And she realizes that only God can. And so there are three questions that Leah has that we all have when it comes to experiencing the deep sense of being unloved and unwanted. And the three questions are, does God see my tears? Does God care? And does God know what it's like to be unwanted? You hear two words a lot when it comes to being a friend. You hear sympathy and you hear empathy. Sympathy, if you can imagine a pit, right? You and your friend are walking along and your friend has fallen to his pit and it's really deep and he's really short, so you can't, you can't get out. Sympathy is this idea of like running into the woods, like looking around frantically, finding a large branch and then coming back and he's still in the pit and then like throwing the branch down and say, climb up, right? I, I feel so bad for you, so I hope you can climb up, because you're short. Empathy is jumping into the pit with your friend and then pushing him out of that pit. So the difference between sympathy and empathy, sympathy, when you're up on, that, on safe ground, you're like, I feel bad for you because you're down there, right? And it sucks, but I don't really know what it's like because I'm not in the pit, I'm not short. But if you're, what empathy does is empathy invites you to jump into their pain, to know what it's like to feel hopeless, and then to help them out with it. God cares for you, and we hear that a lot, but does God actually know what it's like to be unwanted? Because you know what it's like when you, you go through pain and your friend says, I know what you're feeling, but they really don't. Does God, the one who loves you the most in this world, does he know what it's like to feel that rejection? And he does. He does through his son, Jesus Christ, who came into this world as a man, born in a manger. Jesus came to people to save us from our darkness, to save us from death, to save us from being hated, and to bring love and life to us. And yet it says in Isaiah 53 that he was despised, Jesus was despised and rejected by men. There was nothing in his appearance that would attract us to him. And what we realize is that Leah is in a way a foreshadowing of Jesus. Leah was despised and rejected and used as Jesus was. He was despised and rejected. And people tried to use him. But Jesus came in a way to transform that pain, the pain that was an affliction that was brought upon him, the pain of other people, the pain that was brought upon him with suffering when he was betrayed. As you read the story, right? Peter betrayed his friend Jesus. Jesus took that pain and God transformed that pain into a love that is unconditional for other people. And he came, Jesus came into this world to look for you and I, to look for the people that are lost. When we think on those nights when no one sees those tears, when no one knows how difficult it is, God sees our tears, he hears our cries, and he knows what we're going through, but he responds in a way that's deeply affectionate and embracing. The message of the gospel is shown through Jesus Christ. And I remember when I first came back from the mission field, Growing up overseas, as a senior in college, I came back to America from high school 50 to about 3,000. I didn't know anyone. And the place that was the worst, the place where I felt the most profound sense of loneliness was in the cafeteria. Because I get my tray and I look around. Everyone has a table and I don't know where to sit. And for months, it's kind of like, Oh, I've seen this person in that class. Can I maybe sit with them? And then you sit with them and they completely ignore you. It's that sense of like, 
They don't want you here. And I remember for months feeling that profound sense of like, I, I don't know where I belong. And fortunately, church was worse. Church had so many clicks in my youth group that there was no way you could penetrate those friendships. But eventually, at, my West, at Westwood High School, I made a group of friends, and I, I started to hang out with them, and I found a security. I had a place to go to at B lunches and D lunches, and I was so happy because I didn't have to sit alone anymore. But I saw this guy who was sitting alone, and I remember on June, January 1st, when my friend Christina Girl shot herself in the head and committed suicide. I remember the crowds in the hallways would murmur and say, I wish I didn't say this and that to her. But two weeks later, the bullying continued, and we were back to where we were with being a school that was unkind, that would definitely make sure that you were unwanted. I remember there was a guy who's a senior in my class who never ever talked, his name was Daniel. Even when the teacher like, asked him, like, Daniel, what do you think about Freud? And Freud now is like dead quiet. He would never talk and he would always sit alone at D lunches. And so after Christina's death, I was convicted that as Christians, it's not just abstaining from being mean, but there's a proactive sense of, there's a proactive calling to go out of our way to make people feel loved. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew that lunchtime was the time where I felt most secure. And so I decided that God was prompting me, maybe it looks like sitting with Daniel each lunch. And so when my friends would call me over the table, I was really nervous, but I went over to sit with Daniel, and the first meeting was so awkward. If the teacher can't get down to talk, like, I, I can't. So I was just asking him, like, hey, how was your week? And he's like, all right, I'm just eating. And so I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to tell you my whole life story, okay? So I'm just telling him, telling him. I remember coming home and telling my dad, it was just really awkward. My dad was saying, like, hey, God has you in the same psychology classes with Daniel and the same lunch. I don't really think it's a coincidence. I think he's calling you to love him in a way. And so each lunch... I gave up my time with my friends, and I sat with Daniel. And it was really awkward. Like, he did not talk. When I invited the church into like youth group bowling nights, he was like, nah, I don't want to. But over time, over the months, as we sat together, Daniel started to open up. And he really liked rap. And he was like this really scrawny kid who just didn't appear to be the rap type, but he was. And he wrote these like really, really fire lyrics. So he brought, one day he brought this journal and he said like, I wanna share with you my rap lyrics. And it's just like, it's just so weird. So I was like, okay, I was really happy. And, and so as I read this, it was really sad for him to open up this really precious part of his heart and his life. Because all the lyrics talked about was about how much he hated school and how much he felt unwanted or ignored by the rich kids in school. And it's in that part where you just, you see a glimpse into someone's heart. It's the little things that show a reflection of like, it's a calling that I want, I want to be loved. I want to be accepted. He never came out to church. He never accepted the gospel, even when I told him about Jesus. And I remember the last day of lunch and I just felt like, man, there's, there's no progress with this guy. Like, he doesn't want to hang out with me outside of school. And I was just like, Daniel, I'm sorry <laughs> that it's been like really awkward all these months, but thanks for letting me sit with you. And I'll never forget that like, he looked at me that last lunch. And he, with tears in his eyes, he said, you have no idea what this has meant to me. And I, I'm like really grateful that God allowed me to see like that, those tears well up in his eyes. Because at that moment, like I realized it was all worth it. Like all those lunches to maybe make him feel a little bit more wanted. I remember like <clears throat> last year, I wrote on his wall, it's 10 years, it's been 10 years. Um, <clears throat> I wrote on his birth, like on his wall, a uh, Facebook, yeah, he could come on Facebook. I wrote a happy birthday, basically, right? And he responded, he just said, I still remember those lunches where you sat with me and it still means so much to me. And what I think 
what we can understand from this story of also Leah's life is that God sometimes allows us to feel unwanted and loved so that we can better love those who are unwanted and loved. So that we can better love the Daniels and the Leahs. So that we can turn from being Jacobs and Labans and instead transmit and transform that pain into loving people who aren't loved. Maybe the reason why you don't feel loved at home is because God knows that one day you're gonna help someone who goes through that exact feeling of the pressure of performance. Maybe the reason why God is allowing you to experience pain of feeling like you don't belong in your family or in your friend group or at school or at church is because down the road, years later, you'll be able to share that experience with them. I think God allowed me to not find security at lunches so that I would know what it's like to be in that pit, to be too short to climb out of it. And that's God's gift to us. Because Jesus, in order for us to be loved by the Father, to be found and wanted, he became unwanted by the Father. When he was crucified, he took upon himself all the sins, the wrong things that humanity has ever done, is doing, and will do in the future. Everything that you have done, are doing wrong, and in the future, to make our Father upset and sad. He took that upon himself. And in that moment, when all of humanity's sins are upon Jesus' shoulders, God the Father looks away and rejects Jesus. And Jesus cries out in a loud voice, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And if God could answer, he would say, I've forsaken you so that I would not forsake these people. So that they would not be left unloved and unwanted. That's the sacrifice Jesus made for you and I. We are like Leah's. And we, if we're on this path where we feel unloved and unwanted, we, we stick with this pain, we're gonna become Jacobs and Labans. We already are Jacobs and Labans to other people too. God's invitation for us is to cease from being like Jacob and Laban to other people, to find Jesus in our story of being our, our own Leahs, and to find redemption in his love. So let's pray, um, just in reflection of, of, this, of Leah's story. As we go into a time of prayer, I wanna take us through some points just so we can hear from God. And so prayer, again, as Pastor Deal shared yesterday, is it's a way for us to connect with God in a very personal way. God is so infinite that he's able to hear all of our prayers at once, but he's also so personal that he knows what each of us are going through. And so as, before we go into, and before we get the chance to talk to God, I want you to ask God just one question. God, would you take me back to the place where I feel most unwanted and unloved? Where is that place for me? Who is the Jacob or the Laban in my life? And how am I supposed to earn my worth? So can you ask God that question and just like sit there and hear because God will bring up a memory, he'll bring up an experience, he'll bring up a feeling. But where in my life do I feel unwanted and unloved?
Maybe you feel like Leah. Maybe you connect with her story in a deep way. In a way that you feel like you're asked to perform. You're asked to live to a standard that's really, really hard to live up to. Maybe it's a tightrope that you're pushed to walk on. And people watch your every step as you walk that tightrope across the chasm. What God promises is that he, has, he sees every tear that falls from our eyes. The moments that we felt that we're not enough. The moments that we feel like we're not good enough for so-and-so. But Jesus' message to us is, yes, I see your pain. I see the tears. I see the suffering. Suffering will always be there in our life. It's, it's going to come. We're going to feel like we failed people. We're going to disappoint people. But God's message for us, for you, and for me, is that he has walked that path for us. So there's no way that we can, be, that we can earn more love or affection from him. Because just as Jacob was a horrible husband to Leah, God redeems that by being a faithful bride to Leah himself. Maybe you've been used by other people. God will be, he will prove to be that faithful one who loves you unconditionally. Maybe you've had a hard father or mother who expects so much out of you. God will prove himself to be the father who delights in you being you. And so can we pray just for one thing? Can we pray, God, would you show me your love? I want to experience your love. I want to experience what it's like to be wanted, not for what I can bring or produce, but simply for who I am. So can we pray that prayer? Can we just say, God, I, I, want, I don't know what it's fully like. There's nothing on this earth that has loved me for me being me. But just like the Velveteen Rabbit says, when you're loved, you become real and authentic. So God, I want to be real. I want to be authentic. I want to be myself. Would you show me a love that loves me for being me? Now, what does that look like? So let's ask God, God, would you just take me to a place where I can hear you, as it says in Zephaniah 3, 17 and 20, you sing over me in delight and rejoicing. So let's pray for a couple minutes and we'll pray through one last prayer request. next invitation for prayer is it's not about ourselves but can we pray for the Daniels um, in our own lives the ones who 
you can sense feel unloved or unwanted. It might be your sibling. It might be your parent. It might be your best friend at school or someone in this room. But as the Holy Spirit brings those words and those names and those faces to your hearts, can we pray and ask, God, would you use me? I know what it's like to feel unloved and unwanted. Would you use me to love and bring love and life and a sense of belonging to those who are living in darkness and hopelessness, who are feeling that they're unworthy? Would you transform my pain so that I can bring healing and redemption to those lives and to those stories? So let's pray for those people that come to mind. Let's pray and ask God, God, would you use me? And God will speak to you. He will give you specific ways that he's calling you to love. Maybe it's sitting with them at lunch. Maybe it's talking to them. Maybe it's being with them. Maybe it's driving over to a place to love them in a way by simply being. But let's pray. Let's ask God, God, would you help me to love with a greater capacity? Refill that tank in my heart of love for others. Jesus, you see the tears that we have, the tears that could tell so many stories of so many years or months or weeks of pain, of being told that we're not enough, of being told that we should be ashamed of ourselves. You alone know the deepest recesses of our hearts. And yet, God, you're one who loves us so deeply. You're not repulsed or even shocked by what's inside. You're not scared of our tears. You don't tell us to wipe away our tears and to calm ourselves down, but you're there with us. You love us through our pain. You love us as the is. When the rest of the world says that we're ugly, when the rest of the world marginalizes us or mitigates us, God, you're there singing over us delighting and rejoicing over us. So would you help us? Would you make that true to our hearts? As we sing to you, God, as we sing, may we understand and experience your love in a deeper way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, let's rise as we just respond and, uh, to the word and a few songs of worship.